In today's video, we're going to be looking at regulation of cardiac mechanical function. We know from the previous video that cardiac output is equal to stroke volume times heart rate. So we need to change either stroke volume or heart rate if we want to change cardiac output. Let's start with some definitions. Stroke volume is defined as the difference between end diastolic volume and end systolic volume. Put another way, this is the difference between the volume of the heart before it contracts and the volume after it contracts. We can change the end diastolic volume and end systolic volume by changing the preload and the afterload of the heart. What are they exactly? Well, preload is the increased filling of the ventricles and thus stretch on the wall of the ventricle. Doing so allows the ventricles to contract with more force as a consequence of something known as the force-length relationship of myocytes. Put in simple terms, this is where, um, up to a point, the more you stretch myocytes, the more efficient and stronger they become at contracting. We also can look at afterload, which is the pressures and forces the heart has to work against when ejecting blood. It's affected by peripheral resistance as the major contributor, and a stenosed outlet valve, such as the aortic valve, can also have an effect. If we want to increase cardiac output, we need to increase preload, or get better at overcoming the afterload, or perhaps just decrease the afterload. So, there are a series of modifiable traits of the heart that allow us to do so. The first is inotropy, defined as the force of contraction of a heart or its contractility. It's very dependent on intracellular calcium concentrations, as calcium is capable of binding a protein called troponin C within the cardiac myocyte. Doing so allows the cell to contract. If we remove the calcium, we do not get any more contraction. So, by increasing intracellular calcium concentrations, we get increased contraction, and therefore increased inotropy. We can trigger a calcium influx into the myocyte using the sympathetic nervous system. This acts on a stimulatory G-protein coupled receptor in the myocardium that leads to an increased calcium influx via the L-type calcium channels, and therefore increased calcium concentrations inside the cell. Sympathetic nervous system activation is also able to increase sarcoplasmic reticulum activity, which is where intracellular calcium is sequestered and stored in between uses. We can also look at modifying leucotropy, which is the opposite of inotropy. It's the ability of the heart to relax in between beats. The logic is, if the ventricles can relax more between beats, they are easier to fill, which allows us to increase the end diastolic volume, and therefore preload. Leucotropy is very dependent on the ability to remove calcium from a cell, but fortunately, the sympathetic nervous system doesn't just increase calcium concentrations, it also upregulates the calcium pumps that allow us to move calcium outside of a cell in between each beats. That way, we can get calcium outside of a heart almost as quickly as we can get it in. So, to summarize so far, to increase cardiac output, we can increase the preload via increasing the leucotropy, allowing us to increase the end diastolic volume, or we can increase the heart's ability to overcome afterload by increasing inotropy, which results in a lower end systolic volume. As stroke volume is equal to end diastolic volume minus end systolic volume, if we increase end diastolic volume and decrease end systolic volume, we get increased stroke volume and therefore increased cardiac output. All of this can be done by sympathetic simulation of the heart. So that's one side of cardiac output, but what about heart rate? The ability of the heart to beat quickly is called chronotropy, and in a normal, healthy heart is dependent on the firing no rate of the sinoatrial node. Sympathetic nervous system stimulation allows for increased firing of the sinoatrial node, which leads to increased heart rate and therefore increased cardiac output. So, we know a little bit about the factors influencing the heart's ability to pump, but what about the actual structure of the heart? The orientation of the myocytes in the heart is such so as to produce maximum change in volume for a single contraction. Think of it like this. If your myocytes are able to halve their length at any given contraction, if we use myocytes that are only contracting in a single direction, we can halve the volume of our chamber. However, if we change our myocytes to have variable orientation, say some at 90 degrees to others, we can actually change the total volume of a chamber by down to a quarter of its original size. Look at it on this diagram here. In both situations, the myocytes have halved their lengths, 
but in example 2 the total volume change is much greater. This is important pathologically, because in cases of heart failure, the structure of the heart changes. The organized efficient layout is lost, which leads to decreased efficiency of the heart. Another piece of pathology to consider in the heart is hypoxia. All of the mechanisms for increasing cardiac output are dependent on ATP, and ATP production is dependent on the ability of the myocardium to get oxygen. In hypoxia, there is less ATP to go around, so the heart loses its ability to increase inotropy, lusotropy, or chronotropy. Get enough of this loss, and you eventually might not have sufficient cardiac output to stay alive. This is why large myocardial infarctions are such a big deal. Hopefully all of this together makes understanding the mechanical controls of cardiac output a bit easier, and helps grow on your understanding from a previous video. In the next video, we will be looking into how the autonomic nervous system regulates these traits. But until then, thank you for watching.